So you know, about 10 years ago, it was a summer afternoon. I was in Los Angeles at the time. I was just driving my minivan. And as Shu told you, I have four boys. And it was the rare occasion when I happened to be alone in the minivan. <laughs> I had been out running errands by myself. And I was supposed to be driving home. And I just I couldn't get myself to drive home. Because I was feeling really overwhelmed really exhausted, really sad, and then at the same time, feeling really guilty. Because who was I to be sad when I had this beautiful family, these healthy boys, everything I thought I ever wanted, but something was missing. I felt really stuck and unhappy. And I didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't have the strategies to help myself to get out of it. And so I'm driving down the road, and I'm thinking, I can't just drive home right now. So I pulled over to the side of the road, and there was a little park by my house. And there was a grassy area and some basketball courts. And no, I wasn't going to play basketball. <laughs> but I pulled over, and I opened the door, and I just got out. And I started walking through the grass. And I remember I was barefoot at the time, and I saw this big birch tree, you know, one of those trees with the bark that kind of peels off. And I sat down on the ground, and I put my back against the tree. And I curled up my legs. And I put my elbows on my knees and my head in my hands, and I just started crying. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do, and I didn't know who to turn to. And I didn't have the strategies or the tools at the time to get myself out of it. Now, we all go through periods of time where we're struggling, and we maybe don't reach out to help. We don't reach out for the help that we need and deserve, the help that we're worthy of, right? And often, the people around us don't even know that we're struggling, right? Because we get to work and we smile, right? And we show up, and we sing happy birthday to people, and we do all the normal things, but inside we're struggling, right? Inside we're hurting. But we feel guilty, right? Who am I to be struggling? Look at all of these people really hurting. Look at all these people suffering real illnesses, right? So, suffering from real things. And we somehow discount our own struggles. But I'm going to tell you that that's not serving you, and it's not serving those people who have real struggles either, right? So raise your hand if you've ever had a moment where you were struggling, and maybe the people closest to you didn't even know it. Didn't even know it. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. It's true, we've all been there. Now, as she was telling you, my name's Amber Trueblood. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm an author. I always wanted to write books. I have four boys. Right now they are 9, 11, 13, and 14 years old. But that wasn't always the case, right? I went from an early divorce, messy divorce in my early 20s, to now married and together with my husband for 21, 22 years. I went from an infertility diagnosis, didn't think I was going to be able to have children. We were in the process of adopting a baby from China. I was really excited about Then they kicked me out of the program when I got pregnant. To now having four healthy, amazing, very loud, but wonderful boys. I went from a bankruptcy in my early 20s to now having more financial independence and abundance than I ever dreamed possible. And I went from having a therapy practice where I spoke and worked with people one-on-one, -on -one, and it just didn't feel right. I thought, this, this, this isn't really helping people. It's too slow. It's not making the impact that I want to make. Right? It's one person at a time. To now, thanks to Seven Hair Care, standing on this stage speaking to all of you. So thank you so much for allowing me to be here today to speak to all of you. And Zach, if you want to put up the next slide. All right, so you're going to see some pictures of me on the floor. Now, none of these are set up. My husband is a photographer. And I tend to deal with stress and overwhelm sometimes by just collapsing on the floor wherever I happen to be and taking a breath. 
No lie, no lie. And Jamie will say, what, stay there, stay there, and he'll run and get a camera. And I just stay there, okay. And he takes a picture, and it ends up on the internet or on my website. I don't mind. Because everybody needs a break now and then, right? And when we admit that we need a break, then everybody says, oh, well, heck, I need a break too, right? So one day, a couple of months ago, I was doing this big live online talk, okay? It was for one of the biggest audiences I've ever spoke to, and it was online. So it was on my computer at home. I was wearing, you know, pajama pants on the bottom and looking snazzy on top, or so I thought. And my husband got all the boys ready, got them out the door, was taking them to the skate park so that I could have the whole house to myself, right? So that I could be focused and calm, go through my notes, finish my coffee. You know, I felt like, I got this. I got this. And I looked at my watch and I was like, okay, I've got like five minutes before I'm supposed to hit the live button. I'm, I've got everything ready. I'm gonna run to the restroom and then I'll be set. So I go across the little tiny hallway and I go into the restroom and you don't need to know details. But when I went to get out, I, the doorknob wouldn't work. I locked myself into the bathroom. And so I'm half panicking, right? I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. The one time that nobody else is home to come let me out. Because it was one of those things, I don't know if you're anything like me in the last two years, but many things have broken in my house and I've not fixed them yet. And this was one of those things that was just on the verge of breaking but it hadn't quite broken yet. Well, this was the time that it broke. I couldn't get out and I could not believe it. I couldn't yell to anybody. So I'm standing there thinking, okay, here we go. I could do this. All right. I always talk about regulating your central nervous system, calming yourself, being in the moment, right? Dealing with stress and overwhelm. This is testing me right now. So I cannot get it open, try as I might, it's not moving at all. So I turn around, I look the other way and there's a window. So I walk over to the window, I crank it open, I climb out of the window, run around my garage to the front of the house. Thank goodness they had left the door open. And I go in and I sit down. Now I've got about 30 seconds to when I'm supposed to hit the live button. And I'm gonna share with you what I did because the first strategies that I'm gonna share with you today are called in the moment strategies and I used one of them to help me center myself and focus in on the present moment. Because let me tell you something, stress and anxiety and even frustration and anger happen when our attention is focused either on the past, what just happened? Oh my gosh, I can't believe that person said that. Oh my gosh, did you read that email? Did you see that article? Oh my gosh. Or you're worrying about the future, right? It's uncertain or you're anxious about it. But when we focus our attention on the present moment, that's when we can calm our nervous system. That's when we can tell our brain, you are safe. You're safe. You're safe right now. You don't have to be in the fight or flight or freeze zone. You can be calm, you can breathe, you can focus, you can remember things, right? Because when you're in fight or flight, it messes with your memory, it messes with your metabolism, it messes with your circadian rhythms, which affect your sleep. It affects your mood, it affects your relationships, it affects how you sleep and speak and how you move. It affects everything, okay? So, the three st strategies I'm going to share with you right now are for these moments when you have that spike of adrenaline, that spike of cortisol, and you need to center yourself. Because maybe you have a new client that's walking in in one minute, and you just received some really upsetting news, right? Or you had some other distraction that was upsetting to your central nervous system and to your mood, right? And you wanted to calm yourself. Okay, so this is where you're gonna get involved a little bit, Not, nothing crazy, don't worry about it. So I want you to take your left hand, so put, your phone's down if you can. Put everything out of your hands. You're gonna take your left hand and put it flat. And you're gonna take your right hand and you're going to karate chop it, okay? And you're gonna do it six times as quickly as possible and then you're gonna switch. 
So you're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And while you do that, you're gonna breathe. So don't hold your breath during this and put your shoulders like that or it defeats the purpose. So you're going to breathe deeply while you do this. And it only takes really less than 30 seconds. I had a client once that said, well, how long do we do this for? You know, they're thinking like five minutes. And I said, you know, I've never timed myself because it works so quickly to reset your central nervous system that I never counted. I could just feel it. I could feel it calm me down and focus me on the present moment. And it's not self-hypnosis. It doesn't make you forget that you just got locked in the bathroom. It just makes you not upset about it viscerally, right? Does that make sense? So the reason this works is cross-lateral movements like this, and there's many of them, this is just the simplest one to do when you're sitting down, is it facilitates the communication between your right hemisphere and your left hemisphere, right? So there's a connecting portion called the corpus callosum, right? And so the electrical impulses start going back and forth and back and forth when you cross the midline of your body with a movement like this, right? And so what happens is instead of this one part of your brain just perseverating over and over and over, I can't believe the person saw that. I can't believe I got locked in the bathroom. What's my problem? You know, instead of just spinning and spinning and spinning, you're able to balance out the electrical communication in your brain again. And so I love neurohacks, and neurohacks are exactly that. It's a trick to your brain, right? So normally, you feel something, right? And then your brain elicits the neurochemicals that are associated with that feeling. So if you're anxious, and your body's like this, and you're pacing, and your heart's beating, I don't want to describe it too much because I don't want you guys all to start feeling that way then your brain releases those neurochemicals and you feel that way, bless you. And it works in the opposite direction as well. And this is like magic. This is one of my favorite, favorite things to talk about is neurohacks because they work quickly, they're free, they don't add calories to your diet. You know, they're super, super easy to use, right? And the funny thing is, is if you do this, and you're not embarrassed, somebody might ask you, why were you just doing that? And then you can share this knowledge with other people, right? Because man, when everybody around us is calm, that helps us as well, right? And you can teach your kids if you have children too. So when you do this, it facilitates communication between right and left hemispheres, and then your central nervous system can calm, and then your brain releases the neurochemicals that are associated with calm, with ease, with confidence even. So the second neurohack that I'm gonna share with you is even simpler than that, okay? Now, 20 years ago, when I was in college at Occidental, just a couple of miles, well, no, more than that, 500 miles, <laughs> three, um, west of here, I remember learning about these studies that they would have people hold a pencil like this in their mouth, or like this, to simulate a smile or a frown, and then they would test them, and what they found time and time again was that when people smiled, even if they didn't mean it, even if they didn't feel happy, they reported over and over and over again that they were calm, that they felt happier, that they felt more joyful than the people that were holding the pencil to simulate a frown. And the study holds true to this day. So one of the programs that I'll share with you at the end, uh, Outsmart Overwhelm, has a morning ritual in it that I call the Smash Your Mornings, and the S stands for smile, so that you even can begin your day by telling your brain, I'm good, I got this. And your brain is like, oh, okay, all right, I'll release the neurochemicals that you need to feel calm, to feel happy, to feel joyful. So it's a hack, it's a trick that you can use to tell your brain to release the neurochemicals that are gonna support you in feeling more calm and more confident and more at ease. The third strategy is one you've probably seen before and it's a little embarrassing to do and it's one where you're gonna do either a superhero pose like this, right? You're gonna stand with your feet a little bit apart your hands on your hips, you're gonna stick your chest out a little bit, put your chin up, and you're gonna breathe. Maybe add the smile to it as well. 
And that will elicit your brain, that will communicate to your brain, oh my gosh, look at her. She is really confident right now. She's got this. And then when your brain releases those chemicals, then you feel it. So it works backward. All right. And the third one I want to share is, let's see, put up the slide again for me. Okay, stand tall and big. Oh, the next one I'm going to save for another one. So now I want to ask for your help. Raise your hand if you could think right away of one of these that you'd like to use. You can flip it to the next slide, Zach, the giveaway slide. And I don't think it'll be a picture of, you can go one more slide. There you go. Okay, so I want you to raise your hand if you'd be willing to share on the mic with the group. And I'm going to gift you a copy of my book, Stretch Marks, for whoever is brave enough right here in the front. I love it. What's your name? Monet. Monet. Okay, Monet is going to share. Tell me what strategy that you would like to use. Oh, I'm definitely going to use. Oh, let's turn on the mic, Monet. I held it for too long. <laughs> <laughs> we need the mic on. Oh, here we go. I think it's back on now. Hello? Okay. Um, I'm definitely going to be karate chopping my hand. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So it's called a cross lateral movement. You don't have to know the word for it. And there's many of them. And I love it. So I hope you enjoy the book, Monet. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Let's hit the next slide, if you will, Zach. Okay. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. And you'll see yet another picture of me lying on the floor. This is at the Toronto airport. <laughs> It's kind of gross, but I, I tried to be like behind the seats. I figured not very many things had been happening back there, hopefully. And you'll see me on top with my children and a bunch of suitcases. Let me just take a sip here. So at the beginning of this chat, there was a slide. I don't know if any of you saw it. Zach, can I challenge you for a minute to go back to that second slide that had the QR code with the SuperSense? And I'm going to ask you guys to get your phones out. And it's a very quick quiz, but this will help us move forward. So if you take the quiz, there's just 10 questions. And then we'll talk about your SuperSense and how you can utilize that to reduce stress and overwhelm and anxiety when you need it and to lift your mood when you're looking for a lift. Is it working? Do we need to like expand it, make it bigger? Okay. Oh, nice. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot there, Zach, but thank you. And don't think about your answers too deeply. Just go with your first gut instinct. Sometimes the answer will come to you really quickly and be very obvious. Other times it's like, eh, could be this one, could be that one. It's okay. Just go with your first gut instinct. All right, Zach, I think we can go back to the next page. It looks like everybody's got it by now. You can just go ahead and look up here when you're done. Okay. 
guys ready? Zach, maybe this is when we should have done the music from my kid's band. I never sent that to you. <laughs> Next time. Okay, so I'm just going to please go ahead and finish up, and I'm going to just start talking a little bit about super senses. So everybody has one sense that they're a little bit more sensitive to. They're a little bit more triggered by than those around them. Right? Everybody has one sense. And the funny thing is, so I just turned in my manuscript for my next book, and I have a big section in it that's about super senses. And then I created my quiz, and I took the quiz, and I thought I was an auditory super sensor. I would have bet anything, right? But my house is full of very loud boys, and they all play musical instruments. I have two acoustic drum sets in my house. Yeah. And I don't. Um, smoke. Anyway, I was going to say something else, but <laughs> I, I utilize these strategies every day to maintain my sanity so that I can show up as the mom, as the wife, as the human that I want to show up as, right? And I don't walk around feeling grouchy. Now, I have my days for sure. I am far from perfect. I'm still learning. And that's why I always try to gather new tools and I get excited about sharing them. So when I took the quiz and I thought, well, for sure I'm going to be auditory because I'm, I walk around with earphones in my house sometimes because it's so loud. But I wasn't. I was a visual super sensor, which shocked me because I'm really messy. I don't take the time to clean up stuff. And I realized, holy mackerel, that is adding to my stress and anxiety in the house is just the clutter and the mayhem visually speaking. And so by knowing that, I now take the time to do two things. There's one area in my kitchen every morning that I take the time to clean off, and that immediately calms me down. And then there's one table next to my desk in my office that until last week, I finally just cleaned out the whole space, but it was just full of papers and piles and things. And so I would get a neutral colored blanket and literally just cover it up so I didn't have to look at it because I just didn't want to take the two hours to go clean it up, right? We don't always, we can't always stop everything to organize and clean our life like we'd like. So you do what you can, right? There's a bucket of laundry. Now, mind you, we have two couches in our living room that we push together, and that's the laundry couch. I'm not kidding. And there will be sometimes six loads of clean laundry on that couch. So I walk by like this if I'm not ready to deal with it, or the kids. It's, it's mostly their job, but sometimes it sits there all day. So raise your hand if you are a visual super sensor. Okay, got some people out there. All right, raise your hand if you're an auditory super sensor. Okay, do we have any super smellers here? Ooh, a lot. Nice, okay. Anybody who's tactile, a tactile super sensor? Nice. And what did I miss? Oh, super taster. Ooh, I like it. It's a big mix. I think because you guys are all artists, right? So we have a lot of different sensory experiences. So the secret to using super senses and this information about yourself is that you can use these strategies to reduce your stress and overwhelm when you need to, and to increase your mood and your emotional well-being when you need to, okay? So let me explain how it works. So raise your hand again if you were the auditory. Okay, so this is for you if you're auditory. Music, right? Okay, so we can use music to affect our mood. We all know this, right? But for you especially, what I'm gonna challenge you to do today is to create some playlists that are associated with specific types of moods. Right? So if you're looking to achieve a mood that is calm, I just need to chill and calm out, okay? Then you get a playlist together for that. If you are looking to get excited, right? Amp up your energy a little bit. You have a playlist for that. 
okay? And I always tell my clients to find music that you really loved between the ages of 14 and 24, because those are the ages that you were most neuroplastic in the brain. And what that means is that the music that you loved during that time, the movies that you loved, the TV shows that you loved, they hit you viscerally, they hit you deep down on a whole different level than a song that you loved a couple years ago or this summer, Monet is nodding her head. It's very true. Have you ever showed somebody who had never seen your favorite movie from when you were a teenager before? And you're like, oh my gosh, I remember showing my sister, I have a half sister who's 10 years younger than me, and I was telling her about Stand By Me. That ages me a little bit, I'm gonna be 48 in a couple months. And I said, oh my gosh, you have to see this movie, it's amazing. And she was like, eh, that's okay. And you're like, how could this not change your life? It was amazing, right? So the movies and the music that we listened to during those years hit us on a whole different level, which is fantastic because now we can use that information to help our emotional well-being now in our adult bodies with our not-so-neuroplastic brains, okay? And we can use that to lift our moods. So raise your hand if you're a visual super sensor again. Okay, so you're the ones that need to hide the laundry on the couch. And even positive visual stimuli can be overwhelming. So if you are at a point where, man, you're maxed out, you are stressed, you are having a week, it's rough, you're struggling emotionally, that's when even a bunch of beautiful paintings on the walls, even a bunch of beautiful, colorful pillows on your sofa can be overwhelming Visually, it could be overstimulating to your system. So that's when you want to maybe take some stuff off the walls, put them in the closet, turn them around, put them under a sofa. Make your visual field calmer and less stimulating, and that will help your nervous system. The same note, you are the very people that say you're working and you peek out the window and you see, oh my gosh, look at the colors in the sky, it's really pretty out there. And then you go back to work right, or you go back to doing what you're doing. Instead, I challenge you to stop what you're doing if possible. Go outside, leave your phone behind. This is not look at a sunset through your viewfinder on your camera. This is actually take it in visually. Look at it with your eyeballs, right? Take it in, absorb it, absorb that visually and it will help your entire nervous system. It will help calm you and relax you and get you into the moment. If you're a um, super smeller, so that's when creams, lotions, essential oils, right? Your products that are your favorites, even candles. You probably already know certain scents that lead to certain emotional states. So maybe when you smell lavender, it relaxes you. And maybe when you smell something with citrus, it kind of emboldens you a little bit. And maybe when you smell... I don't know, what's another, give me some other sense, super smell. What is it? Eucalyptus. eucalyptus. So what emotion do you feel when you smell eucalyptus? Joy. Joy. I love it. Beautiful. So all of your super senses can be used. And the other thing I want to note before I move on from super senses is that you may live with somebody or work with somebody who has a different super sense than you. And you think, why are you getting all irritated about the pillows there, the mess? Why are you getting irritated that I burnt something on the stove? Whatever, open a window. So by acknowledging your own super sense and by acknowledging that the person next to you might trigger differently than you, you can then maybe, maybe have a little bit more compassion for their emotional state and their emotional reaction. And then you can share with them, hey, you know how it really bugs you when I burn something? I'm not a very good cook. I burn things all the time. So maybe, just maybe, you can help them understand you better, and you can understand them better by understanding their super sense. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. I think we're doing another giveaway. All right, so raise your hand if you and Michael will find you, if you can share your super sense and the one thing specifically you're gonna do when you get home to help use your super sense to reduce stress and anxiety in your life. All right.
And say your name. I'm Kayla. Hi, Kayla. So I'm a visual. Okay. And one of my absolute favorite things is stepping outside and looking at the sunset. Oh, I love it. So you're already doing it. Yeah, I'm already doing it. It makes me so happy. Bonus points for Kayla. Okay, I'm going to challenge you, Kayla, before you give back the mic. What's one additional thing? Since you're already doing that, let's, because I want you to come out of this with something you didn't already know. So let's, I'm going to challenge you. What's one other thing that you can do? I like the blanket over things that give me, like, stress and anxiety because like I stare at it and I'm like I don't like this I like just kind of covering it up for a minute beautiful beautiful thank you for sharing let's clap for her yeah I love it okay we can go to the next slide Zach okay here I am laying on the floor this is in Cincinnati at a rental house now <laughs> what I didn't explain earlier was that I mentioned my kids were musicians right and all four of my kids and my husband and I spent 16 months traveling through 60 different cities across the US and Canada. When two of my boys were cast in a Broadway musical called The School of Rock. Raise your hand if you remember a movie with Jack Black called The School of Rock. Did anybody see it when it came around? in the stage, on the stage, anybody? Ah, bummer. Okay, so Andrew Lloyd Webber bought the rights to it, he put it on Broadway, it did well, they opened a touring company, and that's where my family joined the circus. <laughs> Seriously. And I actually wrote that book, Stretch Marks, while we were on tour, which some people say, show off, I wrote a book. It wasn't that, it was actually the opposite because that was a passion project. I love writing, right? And I had all of these thoughts and feelings and ideas that I wanted to share and I had to put them down into paper. And so writing this book actually fueled me deeply on the inside right? It fueled my emotional well-being so that then I had more to give, right? I had more energy. I had more time. I had more attention that I could give to others because my emotional reserves were raised. I call it an emotional bank account, right? So we all kind of go up and down in our emotional bank account. And when it's really low, that's when you want to use these strategies that I'm sharing with you today. And it's when it's high, you know, you're doing well. You can kind of handle more. So when I wrote the book, it really raised the level in my emotional bank account so that then I could show up in a way that felt good, right? So let's go back to that slide real quick. All right, yeah, back to there. So when I was on the tour, I had to use preventative strategies to maintain my emotional wellness, okay? So I'm gonna give you three that I want you to use and I want to, let me, let me share a quick story, okay? Because I can feel some energy. It's hard to sit for this amount of time, right? Okay, so let's do this. Everybody stand up, okay? In the afternoons, are you ever, I feel like in the afternoons, and this is like right about that time when you're, I used to feel like, oh my gosh, I cannot, I can't believe it's only three o'clock. I have to do this for like five more hours? Are you kidding me? Like, I'm ready to go to sleep right now. I just want to turn on Netflix and pour a big, nice bottle of Pinot Noir. Come on, please. Are you kidding me? And that's very common. We all go through these afternoon slumps. It's very normal. So the three strategies I'm going to share with you today are to get through those slumps, okay? So I know, so let's just like, you guys probably need to move around a little bit. You can take off your shoes. Just shake it out a little bit, shoot your head, because I want you to be able to hear, and if your body is agitated, then you can't even absorb what I'm gonna say. And I know it's a long chat, so, um, so I wanna make it fun and engaging for you, too. All right? Okay, so you can sit back down if you want to. If you still need to stand for a minute, I get it. All right, so afternoon play is one of those things. Now, in Outsmart Overwhelm, which is one of the programs that I offer, I talk about a morning routine, and I talk about a nighttime routine, and I have a nighttime um, stretch video, and I have a nighttime guided meditation. And a lot of people talk about morning rituals and nighttime rituals for your emotional well-being, which is awesome, and they're super powerful. 
But today I want to talk about something that's not talked about as often, and that's what you can do in the afternoon. Because, man, sometimes these days go on forever, right? So there are three strategies I want to share with you. The first is afternoon play. And what this is is getting outside if possible, doing something physical with your body that's playful, okay? So if you're at home, this might mean getting on the ground and playing with your pet, right? This might mean if you're at work, bring a hula hoop to work and just hula hooping in the break room. People come in and be like, what is Kayla doing? <laughs> right? It might mean putting on some roller skates and roller skating around the block. Now this is not, if you're like a pro roller skater, this is not for that. This is for like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think I might fall. This is something fun and playful right? If you have kids at home, this is going outside and jumping in the trampoline with them, right? This is playing chase, okay? This is getting out of your seriousness. This is becoming playful and getting in touch with the silly you, okay? And even 10 minutes in the afternoon will help reset you for the rest of the day and the evening. The second one is if you're not feeling energetic like that, you're like, I don't have time for a hula hoop right now, are you kidding me? Amber's crazy. Then I just want you to take a short mindfulness walk. The third thing is if you don't have time, so don't worry, I'll get to that. But the mindfulness walk is one that you're gonna tune into the present moment, because remember I said that stress and anxiety and even depression can come from focusing either on the past or focusing your attention on the future, what hasn't happened yet. So one of the most powerful ways to maintain your emotional well-being is to focus your attention on the present moment. And one of the most effective ways to do that is on a mindfulness walk. And what that means is putting your cell phone away. And it means noticing, wow, well, what's the smallest tree, smallest leaf I can see on that tree, the smallest ant I can see crawling across the sidewalk? What's the subtlest sound I can hear? Okay, I hear the cars, I hear the birds. Oh, there's a truck backing up. I can hear the beeping really far away. By tuning into your senses and the tiniest, subtlest sounds and sights you can detect, that's a sneaky way to really focus your mind and your attention on the present. And that will reset your central nervous system as well so you can remain calm and focused. All right. The third thing is very simple. You don't have to go anywhere. Okay. You don't have to have any props. You don't even have to put your phone. Well, I always recommend you put your phone down. But I want you to just close your eyes, and you could do this with me now, and relax your shoulders. Make sure your hands are relaxed and your jaw is relaxed. And you're going to do five slow, deep breaths. And I want you to do what's called a baby breath. And what I mean by that is when babies breathe, when they inhale, their belly goes out. As adults, we stop doing this. We breathe only up here in our chest, okay? And it hits something different. It tells something different to our brain when we breathe like a baby, right? Because they don't have a care in the world other than getting fed, right? Being warm. They don't have this myriad of non-stop right? Non-stop ideas, thoughts, problems, issues, questions going on in our minds. So we can tune in and relax by breathing in. And as we inhale, stick your belly out. And then exhale, bring it all the way back in. So by closing your eyes, and you can go do this in your car, you can do this in the break room, you can go hide in the bathroom. And you just close your eyes and take five slow, deep breaths. And even that is enough to reset your nervous system. Okay? All right, Zach, I think we're going to do, and Michael, another giveaway here. Okay. So out of those three strategies, we have afternoon walk. We already have a hand up right here. You already know what I'm going to say. Hi. Hello? Yes. I'm Kylie. Hi. And um, the... Strategy that I'm gonna use is I'm gonna go buy all of us hula hoops because <laughs> just the fact of thinking about that brought up my day. Just seeing us hula hooping outside in the nice warm sun, man. I love it. Okay, everybody hula hoops for your teams. And imagine the marketing, right? People driving by be like, Who, what is happening at that salon? I wanna be a part of that because everybody, every adult, secretly wants to get back in touch with the child in them. 
Because we're not allowed to, right? Who says? Who says? So be an example. I love that, Kylie. Thank you so much. All right, Zach, what do we have next? Oh, okay. Here we go. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Who's heard this before? Yeah? Who thinks it's baloney? Okay. All right. Who thinks, yeah, it's a nice thing, but I can't always control who's around me all the time? Admit, yes, honest, honest. All right, okay. You can go to the next slide. All right, let's do one more slide after that. After the quote, here we go. One more, Zach. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna talk about zombies. We're gonna talk about vampires and we're gonna talk about glass walls. This is, this is important stuff, okay? You didn't know that we were gonna talk about these kinds of things here. This is about protecting your emotional state, okay? Which is really important, especially, especially given the last two and a half years, right? Because even if you feel calm, you wake up, you've got everything, you did your little gratitude practice, you did your morning smash because you looked, you went and got Amber's outsmart overwhelm afterwards, and you're like, ah, oh, smash my mornings. I know how to do this. And then you get to work, right? Or you go outside and you run into your neighbor, right? Or you just bump into somebody at the coffee shop and holy mackerel, right? Are they just this cloud of negativity and anger, frustration, right? And all of a sudden now they leave you feeling agitated. Okay, so that's what I want to talk about. So this is about protecting your emotional state when all of a sudden a neighbor, a friend, a partner, could be somebody you live with, brings you down, right? Because their energy is just out there. I, I have a feeling in this room, raise your hand if you're somebody who, who does tend to take on the energy of the people around them. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. And we don't teach kids about this, right? We don't teach younger generations what to do with that, right? I'm working on it. So vampires are people that after you interact with them, you feel drained. You feel depleted. You're just like, somebody just came and sucked all the life force out of me. I'm being dramatic. Sometimes it's more subtle than that, but sometimes it's extreme, right? So your job is to notice that and then either avoid them completely or minimize your time with them. Now, before I move on from vampires, there are secret vampires. And what I mean by this is there are some people that when you're with them, it's really fun. They're really fun. They're kind of like a drug, right? They maybe have a super sarcastic sense of humor, right? They're kind of mean, but it's funny, right? Yeah? Can relate? Or, or they're gossipy, right? They tell amazing stories, but it's kind of gossipy. But it's really fun while you're with them. And then afterwards, this is how you know that they're secret vampires, you feel kind of gross. You feel kind of sick. Something feels off. Okay, so now in your mind, who has a secret vampire in their life? Could be a neighbor, could be a friend, could be a coworker, could be a family member, could be your partner. Yeah? So I'm not saying you, you can always avoid them, but noticing that and noticing, huh, you know, when I have four margaritas, it's really fun, but the next day I feel terrible. Terrible. Secret vampires are like that. When you're with them, when you're in it, you're like, oh my God, she's so funny. And then later you're like, hmm, that something didn't feel right about that. It wasn't nice. It wasn't kind. It wasn't how I want to show up in the world. So this is not about judging other people. This is about noticing other people's influence on your emotional state and you taking responsibility for that by acknowledging and then either avoiding or minimizing the time you spend with those people. Now, zombies are a little bit different. Zombies are content, right? So this could be content that you read. This could be a video that you see. This could be a neighbor telling you a story or a coworker telling you a story. It's any content that after you hear it, it just eats away at you the rest of the day. 
like a zombie, okay? Are you imagining that or is that a different joke? <laughs> okay, so any content that you read in the morning and then you realize, oh my gosh, I'm still thinking about that. It's so, it's so disturbing, it's so sad, it's so upsetting. So I want to say this because there's a lot of content like that going on right now. And people will say, well, if I ignore it, if I don't take it in, it's not being responsible. It's not hiding my head in the sand is not helping anybody. True, very true. And this is where you have to ask yourself, is me taking in this information right now, first of all, how high is my emotional bank account? It's up here? Okay. I'll go read the news. It's down here? I'll wait till tomorrow to read it. That's being responsible, okay? Then you ask yourself, is me knowing this information helping solve the problem? Well, yeah, because now I'm gonna write a letter. I'm going to send a donation. I'm going to do something about it with my actions. I'm not gonna just share the post or whatever, okay? Okay, great, wonderful. If me knowing about this information right now will either deplete me to the point where I can't really function, and it's not helping me, and it's not solving the problem in any way, shape, or form, then I would argue, I don't need to know it. There are plenty of problems on this planet that are really serious and that I want solved, but I know myself, and I know that I won't be able to sleep at night if I spend my days absorbing that kind of content nonstop. I know that I cannot sleep at night, I can't show up as a mom, be crying all the time, upset, angry, so I do what I can in my way to benefit the planet. So you all know your unique gifts and we all have different gifts, thank goodness. Thank goodness, right? So avoiding zombie content is another way that you can really protect your emotional state by acknowledging what you can handle, when you can handle it, and who it's benefiting, okay? So avoiding or minimizing your time absorbing zombie content is something that you can do for yourself. All right, now the third way, can you put back up the screen for me real quick? The third way that you can protect your emotional state is a glass wall. And this is for those times when you can't avoid the zombie or the vampire, right? They're there, right? You're at Thanksgiving dinner or something and your mother-in-law just right there. You can't, like it'd be really obvious if you ran away, okay? So this is when, <laughs> this is when I want you to imagine so they're talking, right? And you're imagining this. You're imagining yourself building a glass wall, like an igloo, right, of clear glass. And you're just listening to them. Oh, oh, that's terrible. Oh, that's, oh that, that happened? I'm so sorry. And in your mind, you're just building this glass wall. Oh, wow, I'm so sorry. Hmm, you're, you're listening. And you're building this wall. And that does two things. It distracts part of your brain from getting sucked into the conversation, okay? 100%, you're still there, you're still listening, but part of your brain is realizing and telling you, I don't have to absorb this, this is not my issue. This is hers. I can, I can choose to take on as much of it as I want to take on. It's my decision. It could be a thin wall, it could be a, ugh. Super, you don't actually do the movements, you just do it in your mind. <laughs> Can you imagine? You're just like, excuse me, grandma. <laughs> don't, that would be weird. Be like Amber said to do this. <laughs> just imagine it. And it will help, it will help. And it tells your brain, it brings it into your conscious awareness. I do not wanna take this on, I don't have to take this on. This is her thing. This is her thing, I can be respectful, be in the room, you can't always run away, right? But I'm gonna protect myself by building a glass wall. Okay, here we go, another giveaway time. Okay, you can do this specifically or you could just share one of the strategies and who you're gonna share it with. All right, Michael, I think we have somebody right here in the front row. Just... Oh, this side of the room is super fast. Okay, let's find somebody over here, I like that. All right, Michael's in charge. All right, who can be brave and share? All right, over here, I love it. Please say your name too. My name is Vanessa. Hi, Vanessa. I've had a vampire friend before and I think that's something to apply because 
It's um, people that you said, like, even the margarita example, where they make you feel really good, but the next day you're having that same feeling. And it's someone who actually, like, recently wants to come back into my life mm -hmm. and I have to think about that because time has passed yeah where I'm like okay maybe it's going to be different so you've given me a lot to think about yeah think about it and you can test the waters you can always change your mind you know because sometimes when we learn things about ourselves we show up differently and they respond to that because when you're not the audience member than you used to be when you're not quite laughing as much as their jokes at their mean jokes they may not do it as much so what i would say remind me your name again vanessa, vanessa. so this is what i would say vanessa when you have a few moments Take some time to focus on the qualities of this person that you really like and appreciate, other than the snarkiness or the gossipiness or whatever it is. And chances are, when you really get into a state of gratitude for those qualities that you appreciate and you want to see more of, you might just find that that's who shows up. Because when we change, people pick up on that, right? So if you're not the same person you were a few years ago, she might not be the same person around you. She might be exactly that same way about other people, but maybe not around you. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, let's see the next slide here. Okay, oh, I'm excited, and I'm laying on the floor again. This is in Culver City, packing. <laughs> and I wanna talk about apologies. And we weren't gonna talk about this, but Shu and Monica said, oh gosh, if we have time, do we have time? We have about five minutes, so I'll go through this one quickly. So apologies are one of the most powerful ways that you can reconnect with somebody that's important to you, okay? And what I want you to think of when you apologize is genuineness. If you are not ready to apologize, if you don't really feel sorry, don't do it. Don't do it yet. Because people can read that. People can tell. So an apology, a true apology, has to be genuine, right? The sooner the better is great. However, if somebody sent you an email today, say you leave, you go back to your hotel room, you see an email from somebody you knew in high school. You haven't seen them in years. And they apologize for something they did or said to you. How would that feel? It would feel good, right? And you don't even know this person anymore. They're not even in your life. So imagine if somebody you really care about, a friend, a family member, apologized to you for something they did, even if it weeks, was weeks ago, even if it was months ago. So the same holds true for you apologizing, okay? Let's go back to the slide real quick if we can. Okay, so we have the timing. Sooner the better, but late is better than never. Being genuine, the benefits are that it will really serve to reconnect you with that person, okay? And the audience. So this is the most important thing. Now, chances are that you have, at one time or another, been snarky or rude or condescending or just kind of not your nicest self to somebody you care about, and there was an audience, right? Maybe one of your coworkers overheard, right? Maybe your kids saw you rolling your eyes at somebody, okay? So I challenge you to have an audience for your own apology. That teaches a lot. So say your kids are there and I say to my husband, uh, I'm sorry, that was really rude the way I said that. I was still thinking about this super annoying email that I just got and I took it out on you and that was not cool and I'm sorry. Imagine if I did that in front of my children sitting right there. What do you think they learn? First of all, they learn I have respect for my spouse, right? They learn that it's cool to take responsibility for your actions and your words, to be vulnerable in front of somebody else, especially somebody you care about. And chances are, when they see that happen over and over again, that they will begin to apologize to one another as well. And they just might grow up and have a relationship with somebody whom they respect and who respects them, right? So really, I challenge you to not only apologize, but to apologize with an audience. All right, I think we have one last giveaway. 
All right, so this is where I want somebody to give me a sample apology like I just did. Who is brave enough to, in the mic, give us a model of an apology? <laughs> she was pointing at you, by the way. She said you were out of practice, yes. unapologizing. All right, let's hear it. We can all learn from this, right? Yes. All right, my name is Sean, Hi, Sean. and uh, recently I have a conflict with my stepbrother, and literally I put on a phone call, and I put his mom on it. And you did I, what? Wait, say that one more time. On a phone call, and I asked him to put his mom on the phone oh. next to him, so okay. as an audience, to hear my apology. And I addressed the fact, and then I apologized and walked on. Amazing, amazing. Let's clap for that, seriously. It's hard to be that vulnerable. All right, Zach, can we put up the next slide? Okay, and the next one. All right, so I want to review with you. We have cross-lateral movements. We talked about using your super sense. We talked about avoiding vampires and zombies and building glass walls. We talked about taking an afternoon reset. And we talked about apologizing genuinely and often. Let's go to the next slide. All right, we can take that off. Now, before I leave today, I want to share with each of you something. You ooh, are like a tsunami. OK, so not the destructive kinds of tsunamis, but a tsunami of thriving, OK? And you, each of you, are at the epicenter. Because when you learn how to raise your emotional well-being, when you learn strategies to get yourself from confused and frustrated or anxious and angry to joyful, excited, happy, confident, worthy, when you begin to thrive, the people around you begin to thrive. Right? It's like a ripple effect, like a tsunami. When you thrive, your children thrive. Your partner thrives. When your family thrives, your community thrives. When your community thrives, businesses thrive. When communities and businesses thrive, entire regions can thrive. And when regions can thrive, then it just cascades outward and outward and bigger and bigger, right? And I would say that when that many people are thriving, we can go from confusion and judgment to understanding, right? And curiosity. We can go from anger and frustration to contentment and joy. We can go from anxiety and insecurity to confidence and calm. And we can go from violence and hate to love and compassion. But it begins with each of you deciding that your emotional self-worth, that your emotional health and wellness is worthy of a lift, is worthy of using strategies like these and others to protect yourself, right? Because you're at the epicenter, right? So self-care is not a luxury. It's not a mani-pedi, okay? Self-care is not a luxury, it's a responsibility. And it begins with you because you are at the epicenter of thriving. And I hope that all of you thrive today and onward. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> <laughs>